In this video, we'll talk about deliberate and accidental data manipulation. Imagine you obtain this plot after collecting your data. It completely confirms your hypothesis, except for that one point. You have more than enough data, and there's probably something wrong with that point anyway, so maybe you should just delete it. In this video, we'll discuss two ways data can be manipulated, outright fraud or through more subtle means which are collectively known as p-hacking. A famous case of scientific fraud is the Schoen scandal. In 2001, a solid-state physicist called Jan Henrik Schoen published dozens of papers, many in top journals like Nature and Science. It later came out that he had been, quote, doing science backwards, starting from the conclusion and creating data to confirm it. He managed to evade detection and have his papers published in such prestigious journals because he based his fake data on theoretical expectations about what would have happened if he had actually done the experiments he said he did. This figure shows an example of a plot he produced for his PhD on the left and a plot he submitted to a journal on the right. He added peaks exactly where they were predicted to be. More than that, he used specific mathematical functions to mimic the shape of real peaks. Eventually, because people do try to replicate experiments, cases like this are discovered, though it may take a while as scientists are usually slow to accuse each other of fraud and there are lots of other reasons why a replication study might not be successful. Outright fraud is thankfully rare. In some cases, you probably should delete outlier data points. For example, if that data point was produced by a really clumsy lab assistant and all the others were measured by a star student, deleting it might be safe. But then again, maybe you shouldn't. Depending on the statistical distribution controlling the errors, perhaps deviations that large are possible and are a key part of the process you're studying. Imagine measuring the yearly income of a random selection of people. Some people might make hundreds or thousands more than the mean, some people might make nothing. Both of these values might be outliers for a particular collection, but they are real data points. A more subtle case of data manipulation is p-hacking. This is, in essence, performing a large number of statistical tests on the data set and only paying attention to the significant ones. This is related to something which is very tempting in the era of big data, testing hypotheses suggested by the data. And indeed, for many, finding patterns in the data is, in fact, is the whole point of data science. However, consider a company which collects huge amounts of data on their customers, like Amazon. If we search hard enough, we can almost certainly find a strong correlation between someone's star sign and their shopping behavior. Since we have 12 signs of the zodiac and hundreds or thousands of possible purchases, we're bound to find something significant. For example, that Leos buy three times more green toothbrushes than average. These results are real in the sense that the correlation coefficients and other statistics are quite large, but this is just a consequence of statistical noise. For correlations like this, which are dredged, doubling the data set would likely cause the association to shrink which would not happen if we had measured a real effect. Common practices that lead to p-hacking include conducting analyses midway through experiments to decide whether to continue collecting data. This can be a major issue in social and experimental science. We could have 20 experiments running and just abandon all the ones that don't show promising results. It's like waiting for Christmas morning, but to avoid p-hacking, we should wait until experiments finish before analyzing the results. A similar issue is stopping data collection once a significant p-value is measured. Remember, when we double the data set, the association should get stronger and the fluctuations reduce. Remember the central limit theorem. So we could get, by chance, five heads in a row, but we can't stop at five and conclude that we have a trick coin. Another example of p-hacking is if there are many response variables and we only report the ones that show significant associations with the independent variable. This is just another example of looking at statistical noise. If we have different groups, say groups each receiving different variations of a treatment, we can p-hack by combining or excluding groups to enhance statistical significance. Another very simple way to p-hack is to delete outliers as mentioned. Real data is surprising. For example, there's a phenomenon called Simpson's paradox, where a trend can be present when data is split into groups, but disappears or reverses when data are combined and vice versa. So, while it might seem nitpicky to, for example, wait until all the data is collected to analyze it, or to continue collecting data when a result appears to be very significant, things like this do occur in real life, and indeed, improper data analysis is a serious issue in academia and beyond. We will discuss p-values extensively in a later lecture. Basically, they're a measure of how likely it is that a result is due to random chance. Smaller is better. The plot here is a test which was run by text mining scientific publications to discover reported significance levels. The researchers compared the number of p-values falling between 0 and 0.025 to the number between 0.025 and 0.05. Since, p since results with p-values greater than this are typically not published, these are the only two bins. They observed far more p-values in the upper bin, the data point being further to the right, which is consistent with severe p-hacking. Think of the practices we suggested already. For example, if data collection is stopped when significance is reached, a lot of values just below 0.05 would be observed. 
The authors found evidence for p-hacking in most disciplines, computer science being a particularly egregious example. There are many ways around this problem. Some are complicated statistical procedures. If you're interested, look up the bond for only correction and associated methods. One of the simplest things to do is to split the data. Looking for patterns in data is okay, but you shouldn't then use the same data to verify that those patterns are real. If you have big data, you could find the pattern based on a subsample of say 10% of the total and confirm it on the remaining 90%. This is an easy way to avoid many of these pitfalls. Generally, you shouldn't let the temptation to get a positive result get in the way of rigorous science. Ultimately, like Schoen or any number of suggestive studies, people will try to replicate your work and bad science will eventually be picked apart.